Good morning, it's good to be here and welcome to our service of worship in the East Church of Scotland in Inverness. Uh, my name is the Reverend Donald Morrison. I was uh, a member in this church with my late wife Margaret from 1990 and uh, from a, we left here in 1993 so that I could study for the ministry and I was ordained into the Free Church of Scotland and was minister for 12 years in Loch Gilped in Argyle, uh, from which place I retired in 2012. So it's good to be back and to uh, think of the memories and of the many people that we knew uh, and of our minister here, the Reverend Ernest Ian MacDonald, whom I greatly esteem. And even though he's been retired for some years, I still regard him as my minister. Well, shall we come before the Lord in prayer? Let us pray. Eternal and ever-blessed Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to uh, gather and to worship you. And although we are not physically present in this building, we are, I trust, uh, present through the medium of the technology that brings us together from our various homes and our various locations. And we thank you, Lord, that despite all the privations that are imposed upon us at this time, yet we can still meet in this way to worship you, the one true and living God, the God who has revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God who delights in the worship of his people. And we pray, Lord, that uh, our worship of you this day would not just be uh, outwardly, um, reading the passages of Scripture that are so well known to us, but that we would truly worship you from the depths of our hearts, giving you a praise and glory because you are the one God who, who is worthy to be worshipped. And Lord, we acknowledge the great difference between you and ourselves. You are from of old. You are eternal. You have no beginning, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we are creatures made from the dust of the ground, and our bodies will one day return to the dust from which they came. But we thank you that you have set eternity in the hearts of men and women, and so we will journey on. And if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then what awaits us when life's journey comes to its inevitable end will be far greater than anything that we have ever experienced here in this uh, life. As Paul writes, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. And so we pray that you would be glad to accept of us our worship this morning, to accept our thankfulness for all that you have done for us, for all that you continue to do for us and will do uh, in the times uh, ahead. We thank you, Lord, for the head of this church. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is still at work building his church. I will build my church and even the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And sometimes, O oh Lord, we can examine ourselves and we can be disappointed at how uh, little effort we put into the furtherance of your kingdom. But we thank you that Jesus himself is the one who is gathering people to himself from the highways and byways uh, of the world. And although we uh, might be small in number here this day, we thank you that throughout the world there are millions and millions of your people who are gathering to worship you, some in a great uh, inner city auditoriums, some in ancient cathedrals, some in tin shacks, and others simply gathering in the open, in the shade, of a tree. But wherever your people are, O oh Lord, we know that you will be with them according to your promise. For your promise is that wherever your people gather, wherever they are in twos and threes, that you will be there in their midst. We thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit, and we pray that your Spirit would indeed be with us today. We thank you for the great privilege that is ours, that we can um, read your word, that we can meditate upon it. And we thank you, Lord, for what you say in Isaiah, that your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. 
whatever that purpose might be. We pray, Lord, that if we need to be encouraged, your word would encourage us today. If we need to be comforted, that your word would comfort us. If we need to be prodded and rebuked and chastised, we pray that your word would do that to us also. So, Lord, we pray that you would remember this church. We thank you for the word that has been faithfully preached here over many, many years. And we pray, eh, Lord, that in your providence, the word would continue to be faithfully preached here in the years to come. We thank you for those who have eh, played their part in the life of this church and who have now gone on into glory to receive the reward a, that reward which you give to your people. And we bless you, Lord, for the fact that in Jesus we have one who can a, sympathize with us in all our weaknesses, a, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so, Lord, we a, pray for any a, of the congregation and those associated with the congregation who are mourning at this time, and we pray that they would be comforted uh, because the Lord Jesus Christ can empathize with them. Uh, he himself shed tears at the graveside of a beloved friend. We thank you, eh, Lord, that uh, Jesus can come alongside us and that he can change us. Uh, we think, O oh Lord, of people we knew and we examine uh, ourselves and how we were in the past and how you, by your Holy Spirit, have are seeking to conform us to the likeness of Christ, changing us and changing our worldview and changing our thoughts so that we think no longer of the things that once gripped us in the past, but our great desire today is to glorify you and to uh, see people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. Remember the interim moderator with these extra duties. Remember the elders. Remember the deacons. Remember all who have a, a, a part to play in the life of this church. And we look forward to the day when the doors of this church will be opened again and people would be made welcome and would be able to come in and uh, without masks to sing uh, your praises. Lord, remember us as a nation uh, in these uh, days and as we are looking forward to um, an election here in Scotland, we pray uh, that you would be pleased to raise up godly men and women who would uh, take us on a path that would be honoring to you. Forgive us, Lord, as a nation that we have forsaken you, the fountain of living water, that we have ignored you, that we have gone our own way, and uh, we are singing the anthem of the world, I'll do it my way. Turn us back to you, O Lord. Revive us, restore us, do whatever it takes to bring us to be the godly nation that we once were. Remember any in the congregation who are troubled or anxious, who are have special needs, whatever their needs might be, we pray that you would come alongside them, O oh Lord, and uh, give them of your counsel, give them of your wisdom, give them of your comforting presence. So bless us now, grant us listening ears and attentive hearts, and may all that we do be to your honor and to your glory in Jesus' name, and with the forgiveness of our many, many sins. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from the Old Testament prophecy of Zephaniah, and if you're using the NIV Pew Bible, you'll find that on page 946. Zephaniah, one of the minor prophets. And we're going to read chapter 3. It's entitled, The Future of Jerusalem. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are arrogant. They are treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning he dispenses his justice, and every new day he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. I have cut off nations 
Their strongholds are demolished. I have left their streets deserted with no one passing through. Their cities are destroyed. No one will be left, no one at all. I said to the city, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her dwelling would not be cut off, nor all my punishments come upon her. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations, to gather the kingdoms, and to pour out my wrath on them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Then will I purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. On that day she will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble who trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will speak no lies, nor will deceit be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The sorrows for the appointed feasts I will remove from you. They are a burden and a reproach to you. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they were put to shame. At that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to that reading of his inspired word. I'd like us to turn again to the passage of Scripture we read. Our text is verse 17 of Zephaniah chapter 3. Verse 17, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. We live in a world that is full of religion, and not a day passes when we hear something on the news about the effects of that religion. And it's not always very positive because the actions of zealous people in various parts of the world can often result in death and in misery. Sometimes on television we get a glimpse of great gatherings of pilgrims of various religions gathering at uh, shrines in one part of the world or another. And it's noticeable that many of these pilgrims many of them who have traveled great distances uh, to get to those uh, celebrations, are dressed in white. They are dressed in white because that signifies purity. It signifies that their sins have been forgiven, or so they hope. But John, in his vision in Revelation in chapter 7, saw a great multitude in heaven, and they also were wearing white robes, but their robes had been made white because they had been washed clean by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their robes had been made white in, by the blood of the Lamb. And without such blood-washed robes, it is impossible to enter into heaven. All the religion in the world, all the rituals in the world, all the arduous pilgrimages that people go through will do nothing to cleanse us of even one single sin. 
but knowing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ will cleanse us of every single sin. In uh, Matthew chapter 22, uh, Jesus gives us the parable of the wedding feast. And it's a picture of the wedding feast of the king's son, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, being wedded to his church. And there are many who refuse to come to the wedding, many who spurn the invitations that have been given to them. And so the king orders his servants to go out into the highways and byways of the world and to compel people to come in. And then eventually the king himself turns up at the wedding feast to survey the various guests. And he sees a man there who is not clad in wedding garments. And he says to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding garments? And the man is left speechless. He can say nothing in his defense. And so the king orders that he be bound and thrown outside into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a picture of the man or woman who tries to enter into heaven by their own efforts or by their own religiosity. The garments that the king was looking for and that all the other guests at the wedding feast were wearing were the spotless, pure, white robes that are given to the Lord's people in exchange for their sins. We pass our sins to Christ who has paid the penalty for them on the cross and in exchange he gives to us his own perfect, righteous uh, robes. There are millions of people all over the world who are engaging in religion. But Christian believers have something far better, far superior than mere religion. We, by God's grace, have been brought into a loving and a trusting relationship with God. Of all the religions of the world, it is only we who have the inestimable privilege of being able to address God as Father and knowing Jesus as our Savior and Lord, but also as our elder brother and as the one who sticks closer to us than any friend. And the relationship we have is a relationship that God himself has established. It's a relationship that he jealously guards and that he has brought to fulfillment through the work of his own dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this particular verse speaks of that relationship. And this chapter emphasizes to us that it is the Lord himself who has done everything for us. We see repeated over and over again the words, I will. In verse 12, I will leave within you the meek and humble. In verse 17, he will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. In verse 18, I will remove from you the sorrows uh, and our sins. And then in verse 19, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will give them praise and honor. I will give you honor and praise and so on. It's a reminder that of the status that we have as Christian men and women is not something uh, of our own doing, but it's all of God's grace. As we read in Ephesians chapter 2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. The God whom we worship, the God of the covenant, is totally committed to his people. And in this particular verse, verse 17, there are three things that I would like to highlight for us this morning. But first, a brief look at the background uh, to this particular book, the prophecy of uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah uh, prophesied during the early part of the reign of Josiah from 640 to 609 B.C., Josiah was a godly king who purged the land of everything that was contrary to God's law. He repaired the temple which had fallen into neglect. He renewed the covenant, as we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, to follow the Lord and keep his commands, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and soul 
and to obey the words of the covenant written in the book. And the first two chapters of this small prophecy speak of terrible judgments. Firstly, a judgment against Judah itself. And it might well be that because of God's judgment against Judah that Josiah himself set about uh, restoring the temple and renewing the covenant. And then it speaks of God's terrible judgment against the entire world and the various nations that existed in the Middle East at that time, the Philistines, Moabites, Ammonites, Cushites, and Assyria. God's judgment being poured out upon godless nations. But like all the other uh, prophecies, it concludes with good news for the Lord's people, the faithful remnant, my worshippers, as God calls them in verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. And they will have cause to uh, rejoice. Sing, O daughter of Zion, we read in verse 14. Shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. And why should they rejoice? Because the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. I'm sure the people of Israel, when they had been taken into captivity uh, by a powerful military nation that had conquered the uh, entire Middle East, the thought of being restored to the land of promise, to the land of Israel, must have seemed a wild dream, something that they would never, ever experience again. But even when the Lord took his people into captivity because of their apostate ways, because of their uh, worshipping of other gods, yet he gave them a promise that one day he would bring them back and he would uh, restore them. And in verse 15, when we speak about the Lord has taken away your punishment, that was not just uh, something that he said to the people who lived at that particular time, but when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, when we trust in the work that he completed upon the cross, then surely that speaks for us also. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has taken our sin and he has placed it on his son. And his son, Jesus, has borne our punishment. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we, through believing in him, might become the righteousness of God. And so, as I said, there are three points in this particular verse that I would like to focus on briefly. And the first point is this, God's a presence. God's a presence. The Lord your God is with you. The Lord your God is with you. And centuries before the time of Zephaniah, centuries before Josiah was seated on the throne in Jerusalem, uh, the Lord had promised Joshua that just as he had been with Moses before him, so he would be with Joshua uh, also. Do not be terrified. We read in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And that same promise is here. In verse 15, The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. We read. And just as he promised to be with Joshua centuries before uh, this particular prophecy was uh, written, so he promises to be with all of his people not occasionally, not just coming by from time to time to see how they're getting on, but with them always, constantly, and on every occasion. And that should be a great encouragement to us, especially at times when we feel uh, weak or inadequate for the tasks that the Lord has given us to do. It's a great comfort to us when we feel lonely, when we feel misunderstood, when we feel forsaken or abandoned, by those around us. It's a great comfort to know that the Lord is with us. I will never leave you nor forsake you, <coughs> is the Lord's promise to Joshua. But it's a promise that I believe 
we can all claim, every single one of us, from the least to the greatest, if we belong to the Lord's people. Moses felt inadequate to confront Pharaoh, and who would not? But the Lord encouraged him. He said, I will be with you. And the great task of the church is to be faithful to the Lord, to be faithful to the Great Commission. And it's often a very daunting task to speak about Jesus. Not everyone wants to hear about him. Talking about Jesus often makes some people very angry and agitated so that they become abusive. But we're not sent off by ourselves. We're not sent off to some distant and lonely post far from help and resources. Remember the words of Jesus at the end of Matthew. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And there lies our confidence. There lies our strength. The fact that we live and serve in the very presence of God himself. It means that he will guide us. It means that he will open doors for us and other doors he will close. It means he will break up the ground before us. He will clear away the obstacles. In Psalm 73, we read, Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. What an encouragement that is to know that the Lord is just is not only with us, but he is holding us by the hand also. So that's the first point, that God is with his people. He is with us. And the second point is God's power. We read here, he is mighty to save. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. But for God's grace, the Israelites would not exist today. When we look back at the Bible, we are given there lists of nations that existed uh, thousands of years ago, the, the Hittites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and uh, the Babylonians, the Assyrians. And what has happened to these nations? Well, they've all been lost in the sands of time. They've been subsumed into other greater nations. Many of them briefly flourished, but they were eventually conquered, and they are no more. A bit like the ancient Picts that the Romans described when they came to Scotland as the painted people. Well, we don't know what happened to the Picts. They were simply subsumed into the various waves of people who moved into Scotland at that time. But the Israelites eh, exist today. The nation of Israel is a testimony to the fact that God is a God of amazing grace. They were taken away into captivity by a great power, but he brought them back and he reestablished them in the land. And he did so because he is a God who is mighty in the power. And the prospect of national restoration must have seemed to the captive people uh, to be an impossible dream. Salvation was beyond their grasp. But as we read in Matthew 19, with God, all things are possible. And so eventually God brought down their captors. He liberated the captives and he brought them back home again. In Isaiah 40, see the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. And in Psalm 126, when Zion's bondage, God turned back as men who dreamed were we. And filled with laughter was our mouth, our tongue with melody. They among the heathen said, the Lord great things for them has wrought. The Lord has done great things for us when joy to us is brought. God used his mighty power to restore his people back to the land of Judah, the land of Israel, and to their capital city of Jerusalem. He saved them because they were his covenant people with whom he had committed himself to a loving, everlasting relationship. He saved them because of his love for them and because he desired to bless them. And he saved them because he desired to bless us also, that in God's great plan to save people from every nation and every tongue, the Savior would come 
from the Jewish people. And so the Jewish people had to be brought home and reestablished that from them eventually would come the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, a, a direct descendant of King David and born of the Virgin Mary. King, De King Jesus, the kings, King of kings and the Lord of lords, who by his death on the cross would one day break the power of sin. God's power is unleashed for the benefit of his people. He saves his people. He sustains them. He protects them. He brings them safely through the storms of life. And he eventually gathers them together at the far shore. There are some people who think they are simply too sinful to be saved, too bad to be forgiven. But remember that with God, all things are possible. If God exerted his power to part the Red Sea and then again to part the waters of the Jordan, can he not also save even the most hardened of sinners? And the answer is a resounding, yes, of course he can. Paul writes, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. When the Bible is read and preached, it's not mere words because God's power goes forth as the gospel is proclaimed. If there was no power in the gospel, then nobody would be saved. We would uh, simply be left uh, in a sinful situation. I wonder, have you, listening in today from your own homes, have you experienced God's power at work in your life? Have you experienced his amazing love poured out upon you because of what Christ has done on the cross. And then when a sinner comes to salvation, can God's power keep that man or woman from slipping back again, from going back into the power of the evil one? And the answer again is, of course, it can. Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And we know that the devil is very powerful, that he exerts a tremendous power. But if you, are a trust, if you are trusting in Jesus today, then you are held in his hand. And from that hand, not even the devil and all his minions can snatch you back again. Jesus is the author of his people's faith, but he is also the finisher, the perfecter of that faith. The work he began, he will bring it to completion. So God is not only with us as a companion, not only with us as an encourager or an onlooker. He is there to unleash his mighty power on our behalf. The Lord of hosts is at our side. And that being so, we need fear nothing and no one. In Psalm 18, with your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. And so God is with us and God's mighty power is protects us, saves us, and empowers us to serve him. And finally, the third point is God's pleasure. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God's pleasure. God takes pleasure in his people. And I don't know what your situation is uh, today. You may be feeling down. You may be feeling anxious. You may be feeling worried. You may feel that the world is against you. But remember this, if you are a child of God, God takes pleasure in you. God loves you. Every single believer, individually and corporately, is the apple of God's eye. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, we read in Isaiah 62, so will your God rejoice over you. Not only that, but he will rejoice over them with singing. You surround me with songs of deliverance, we read in Psalm 32, and we read here that God will rejoice over you 
with singing. I remember when my sons were born, it was two years separating them, and sometimes when they, they wouldn't be quiet at night and they do, couldn't get to sleep, they would sometimes put them in the pram and I would go for a walk along the road with them and uh, I would sing to them. And I don't know whether it was the movement of the pram or whether it was dad singing, but it didn't take long before they went to sleep. I was singing over them because they were the apple of my eye, my sons whom I love. And so God takes pleasure in his people. He does not take pleasure in disobedient sinners. He does not rejoice over those who refuse to bend the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not sing over those who see no beauty in his son, of whom we read in a song of songs that he is altogether lovely. His pleasure is expressed over those who repent of their sin. His pleasure is poured out over those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and whose desire is for him and for the furtherance of his kingdom. He del delights in those who respond to his love, those who are obedient to him. God rejoices, we read in the Gospels, in the presence of the angels over every individual who repents of their sins. And we trust that this Lord's Day, as God's word is read and preached from one time zone to another throughout this beautiful world where he has placed us, that there will be much rejoicing in the presence of the angels, not over one or two saved sinners, but over a great multitude. No parent delights in a way with son or daughter, neither does our heavenly father delight in a disobedient child. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, Jesus tells us in John 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. God's greatest delight is in his son, his beloved son. And we, when we are found in Christ, and then he delights in us uh, also. He will quiet you with his love. Isn't that just a, a beautiful picture? God the Father calming and soothing his children with songs of love, metaphorically rocking them in his arms, just as a loving parent would do to calm a crying child. Never underestimate the sheer depth of God's love for you as a believer this morning. God's love for you is so great that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and to pay the penalty for your sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's a cast iron promise, but have everlasting life. God's presence, God's power, God's pleasure. Not religion, but relationship. Not ritual, but love. The love of a father for his children. That's what the Christian believer enjoys. And John writes in his first epistle, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And then John goes on to say, and that is what we are, as if somehow having written those words, he found it hard to believe that he was a child of God. And so, in closing, may we know God's abiding presence. May we serve him in the power of the Holy Spirit. May we be found obedient to his commands. And may we bask in the love of the God who rejoices over his people with singing. May we love as his beloved children. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And if this morning you are listening to this and you have not yet come to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, would you not love to know God's presence to be with you on every occasion? Would you not love to uh, feel God's power being exercised on your behalf? And would you not love to know God 
rejoicing over you with songs. So my, my great plea for you is if you're listening this morning, you don't put it off for another day, but turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you your many sins. The Lord turns away none who truly seek him. Knock and the door shall be opened. Seek and you shall find. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to these thoughts and these meditations on his word. So we pray. Ever blessed Lord, we thank you for the privilege of knowing you as our God, not a distant, formal uh, figure uh, who cannot be reached, who has hidden himself away in some far distant corner of the universe, but the God who through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come into this world, the God who through Christ can identify with us and can empathize and sympathize with us in all that we do and all that we experience. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit who guides us day by day and who empowers us. So, Lord, take away anything said this morning that is contrary to your word, and may the glory be yours and may the blessings be ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And now go in peace, and may God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, rest and remain with you, and those whom you love now and forever. Amen.